All right, all right. Good morning, hello, and welcome to the Coach's Corner brought to you by the Endurance Lab, where the coaches from the lab recap the week and answer your questions from the forum. My name's Jason Flores, one of your Endurance Lab coaches, and today I'm joined by the whole crew. I've got Taya Friestead, Andrea Cullen, and Ian Murray here with me. Good morning, everybody, and sorry for the technical difficulties, but we are on board and ready to roll. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. All right, we're going to get started right off the top of the hat. We're going to go straight into hot topics in the lab. And this week is all about racing, racing, racing. We've got race stories. We've got all kinds of stuff going on and some tips and tricks that can help you um, either just get a good laugh at other people's stories or at least take a little bit away to kind of uh, make, some, make some preparations as much as we can to have a good experience at our, um, our big rides or big races. Um, so I'm going to go, it's, um, I think uh, we haven't heard too much um, from Ian in the, in the last couple of weeks. He's been traveling, but looks like he's all set up. So uh, welcome back, Ian, and um, uh, let, let's get started and uh, talk a little bit and share a little bit about uh, your experiences over the last couple of weeks. Hey, thanks, Jason. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't say I'm all set up. In fact, my Zwift <laughs> set up, most of my bikes, most of my stuff won't be here for the next two or three weeks, so that's pretty uh, awesome. Yeah, so I'm riding <laughs> my, my new race bike, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and a new single speed that I got for commuting. But other than that, everything's okay. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, um, those of you who followed it on uh, Zwift blog, and you know, we talked about it a few times, I went and raced the international track on Union World Championships in Denmark uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I was getting all pumped. It was, you know, a little tough with the move uh, right before leaving. But I was all good to go. I got everything settled. I got the bike tweaked right before I packed it up, um, and so this was on the 4th of July, I packed up my bike and took a picture of it and put it on Instagram, and I tagged the bike company of that brand, which knew I was going to Worlds back in November, as I discussed it with them, and we were flying out on Thursday afternoon. Thursday at noon, I received an email from the company saying, hey, um... Yeah, so our bike never really got certified as ITU legal. Sorry about that. Um, you need to find a new bike to ride. Sorry, I hope it's not an inconvenience. Uh, yeah, so that was awesome. So that set into pure panic mode as I was already packed up, everything ready to go. Um, we were literally going to the airport four hours from the time I got that email. Uh, yeah, so I... Uh, I got in a panic mode. There was uh, my wife actually came downstairs because she heard me say something. It was like I think what came out of my mouth was "Oh geez." <laughs> it was like "Oh dear." <laughs> yes. Something Bully like. Goalie. Yeah. What the fruit? We'll say that. What the fruit? <laughs> uh, uh, to steal from uh, you know from Orca Scott. Uh, anyway, so. She comes down and we start, I start immediately, I go into the race website to see if you can rent the bike, which they have nothing. They haven't had anything for two months or three months. And then my wife came up with a brilliant idea. And it pretty much proves that she's like the best wife ever. And it just, uh, it started out with, you know what? You should buy a new bike. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I was like, and I knew I just married you for a reason. Uh, so I got... I had two, two ideas. One, we were flying to Florida to pick up my nephew, and I knew I could go to Miami and pick up a Ventum if I had to at the corporate headquarters there. Um, I had a couple contacts there at the company. But the other one was I'd heard of this company called Premier Tactical um, on Slow Twitch. There's a lot written about them. Really fast bike in the wind tunnel. Great deal. Um, it's light. It's actually one of the lightest tri bikes on the market. And, uh, and it comes with a bike case, too. So... I called up the I called up the number, and it come it gets answered by like a Google Voice uh, thing that's to help direct you, and it asks for your name. And so I give my name, and it just happens to be that there's another Ian Murray out in LA who's uh, big in the tri scene and bike fitting scene, and uh, it turns out that that other Ian Murray helped Dan, the owner of Premier Tactical, do the wind tu wind tunnel testing for this bike. Oh. So he thought it was this other Ian Murray calling. So the owner <laughs> of the company picked up the phone. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. So 
about two minutes into the conversation, he realizes he's not talking to the Ian Murray he knows. He's talking to the other, and I would argue, more famous Ian Murray, uh, <laughs> Endurance Lab and Team ODZ. Uh, and so within three hours, we had – he had – put the bike together based on the build specs that I, that I told him based on the sizing and the um, fit that I talked, we talked about and had FedExed it out to my folks. Uh, Cause that's where we were going to pick up my nephew. So we, I got it the next day. Um, wow. Yeah. So I put the bike together and uh, you know, it was pretty good. He's there for me. If I needed to talk to him to get the bike together, did a, a huge, I did a really, really long ride that day. It was nine miles. Uh, <laughs> And then I put the bike back in the case, disassembled it, put it back in the case, and got ready to go. Got to Denmark, jumped it out for another long 25-mile ride, um, which was awesome. And we started out getting race week ready. And um, throughout the week, we kept hearing from the other races that had happened in the other places, uh, Middle Fart and another, uh, another town uh, in the same area of Denmark. And people were talking about jellyfish, getting stung up. People getting out all swollen up, uh, burning sensations from the jellyfish thing. So it was oh jellyfish Yeah. So, of course, the people I was with, some of them were freaking out and panicking, um, as you might expect. Uh, being that they're all from Key West and they get jellyfish, and the jellyfish there are pretty, pretty good size and pretty nasty. So when you get stung in the Keys by jellyfish, it hurts. Um, but these were little small, smaller moon jellies, so they weren't that big of a deal. Well... We go to the, the day before the race, we go to the swim practice. And I, I just, I decided I wasn't getting in. I didn't really need to worry about it. Um, um, I didn't care about the, um, about the sighting or the water temperature. It was fine. So as I'm standing there waiting for the other athletes to come out of the water with uh, one of my friend's husband, or two, the, the hus- two husbands of other people that were swimming, a guy gets out of the water and he has a lamprey eel falls off his wetsuit. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, is yeah. It had connected to him while he was swimming, or either waiting to get onto the platform. So, and it just dropped off. And we're not talking like a little, you know, six incher. It's eighteen inches. It's like the apocalypse happening. Yeah, and there was all the, and you could see the jellyfish in the water. It was so many. There were so many jellyfish. You could just see it from the surface. So, mm-hmm. um, so we we made the conscious decision to not tell the other people in the water about the eels until after the race uh, because that would have set into panic mode. But so we, we finally get into, the, get into the race, jump in the water, and you can just feel the jellyfish in your hand as you're, as you're stroking. And, and I, I put my, middle, my finger right through a couple of them, so I know a couple of them got a, uh, wow. yeah, you got a little prostate exam um, as I was swimming. But, yeah, so you could just feel you like scooping them out with your hand. I kind of had to roll a little bit more to make sure I wasn't taking any, you know, ingesting any. Um, protein. Uh, like <laughs> I got one sting in the foot. It was it was pretty fun. Um, and we all and and even the swim. And Andrew will know this. I got caught in the middle of a pack on a swim, and the pack just kind of kept veering left and veering left and veering left until oh, we were yeah. Well, yeah, of course. But you couldn't do anything about it because if I went right out in the middle of a fight, so I was just like, ah, crap. So then they we caught where we had to do a hard ninety degree turn to the right to get back on course. And that's, it was just like watching uh, Finding Nemo with all the, all the fish uh, grouped up in the school. That's what we were. We were just a giant school of fish. Uh, so get through that. Um, I get out, I get onto the bike, and I do my flying mount on the bike. But here's the thing. It's a new bike. I don't have a torque wrench with me. So I'm kind of torquing things down by feel when I set the bike up. And I don't weigh very much, but apparently when you do a flying mount on the bike and you don't hit it just right, it does knock your seat down a little bit if you don't have it tightened enough. Uh, and there's a huge difference in three millimeters in your seat if you, if you weren't aware of that. Um, this is why a fit is very important, boys and girls, um, because I could not get to full extension when I was pedaling. In fact, I was nowhere near full extension, so I could just feel my Achilles tightening up and tightening up and tightening up. For 76 miles. Get out into transition. And first off, it takes me. I have no sensation really in my hands. Getting my shoes on. I don't feel my feet either. Um, I get out. 
And I start running up this hill because we, our transition was in a parking garage and our exit was out of the parking garage, which as you can imagine is up a little ramp. And my Achilles were burning. It's something I've never had on a run, but new position, different seat adjustment due to my flying mount that almost cost me to have to consider my ability to give birth or not give birth, but father, <laughs> child, father, children. <laughs> Uh, as I as I hit the seat wrong and slid off and caught myself just before I went into the bar sitting position, um, yeah. So I get out on the run. And I have to pee, but I was like, well, I, I I didn't go on the bike because I had to go about eight miles before the end. I was like, well, yeah, but they said there's gonna be a bunch of bathrooms and transitions. So I'll just go there rather than pee my suit because it's cold. All right. So I get out transition. I said, where's the bathroom? They pointed to the exit. I was like, all right, great. There was no bathroom at the exit. All right, well, the race, race uh, officials or the ITU officials brief, there'll be bathrooms at every aid station. And there's an aid station about every 1,500 meters. Awesome. Right? 1,500 to 2,000 meters, awesome. I'll get the next one. Kilometer six is when I found my first bathroom. <laughs> oh, You're yeah, not boy. selling this at all. <laughs> Three yeah. and a half, four months. Yeah, you definitely sign up for this race next year, everybody. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah I, was, I, I was pretty – well, so – Actually, at about kilometer two, I'd gotten onto the trail, and I was like, I saw some French dude pull off in the, into the trees to take a pee. I was like, that's a good idea. So I'd pull off into the trees just as first place woman is coming past on her, for her uh, she's a lap or two ahead because they started way earlier. But she's a um, first place woman is coming past me, which means there's an ITU official on a bike right behind her who blows her whistle and yells at me to not pee in the bushes, so I have to get back on the course. Oh, ah, come on. <laughs> it was like the only place I could have pulled off because then you, you get off the trail and you go through your residential neighborhood and I didn't really want to pee there. I actually asked somebody, so their bathroom here is a bathroom and one of the guys was like, man, just go and pee in that guy's yard. I was like, dude, I can't do that. They'll DQ me. So I finally find the bathroom at about kilometer six and then I felt good after that. But at that point, you know, my, my Achilles were burning, my hands, I could almost get my hands back and I could feel my feet at that point. Not to the point where I could actually have good foot sensation, but I could just feel that I was running on something below my ankles. It was just dunk, dunk. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, I ended up seventh in my age group, um, went top 10% overall. So I'm, I'm happy with the result, but I know it could have been a lot better had I had a lot of other uh, things going on. And, and fortunately, you know, the aquatic life, I figured if I got a land break, he'd probably just maybe swim a little bit and make me faster. So I wasn't worried about that. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was definitely an interesting race. Uh, nothing went right um, from the get go with this one, uh, but still came out with a decent result. So I'm pretty happy about that. That's pretty impressive, Ian. Considering everything, the cards against you, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, for for your swim, um, those I guess your aquatic life were they actually like biting people? Or are they just kind of in the mix and swimming around and and that sort of thing? What was actually? Well, the jellies were stinging you if you got on. They don't obviously come and attack you. They're not uh, Portuguese man of war, but when you come on them, they'll sting you. But these were little bitty box jellies. There were only a few of the, the red one or the moon jellies. There were only a few of the, the pink meanies uh, wow. is what we call them in Key West. But I got, like I said, I, I got one. It was my fault because I, when I gave my kick, I mean, I got him, I got him straight up right between the toes and he got me with his tentacles. Wow. Um, but yeah, so there was a little bit of stinging. Um, for the earlier events, there were bigger ones because they were out in open water. We were in the harbor, so it was a little more uh, protected. So we got much more of the smaller ones. Um, but yeah, there were people getting stung up. It, it just, you know, it is what it is. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's not like it was out in Australia, you know, out near Perth and stuff where they have, you know, a 11 or 12 foot great white shark uh, patrolling the swim course. That's nuts. That's nuts. And then for the and then for your bike, um, everything else um, kind of put together. You know, this is all new for you. So like gear, 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 gear setup, aero setup. You were able to get that all dialed in to work for you. Uh, more or less. The gear setup was nice because it came with the new Di2, so it had the synchronized shifting, uh, which mm -hmm. was good. The aero position was a little different because I've been using parallel aero bars, and these are slightly angled in. Um, yeah. So, but also because of how I hit on the seat and I didn't have everything torqued down as much as I should have, the seat slightly tilted down. So I spent the entire ride, you know, pushing myself backwards into yeah. the saddle, um, which is interesting. And, and this bike came with a uh, deeper front wheel. So in the crosswinds, I had to get used to that real quick. 
to lots of lots of new things, things that we shouldn't do and shouldn't change the week before race. Um, but it sounds like uh, you were able to uh, kind of come above that and uh, actually come up with a really good result, man. That, that's awesome. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I mean, I still, I was, I averaged right around like a normalized power of like 205 watts or 206 watts. Um, so like 3.2 watts a kilo. And then, um, you know, I had a, it, it was actually, I will tell you the biggest thing in this one compared to most tries is that the, the uh, draft box was a lot longer. It was a, uh, a 12 meter draft box. Um, which is pretty significant compared to WTC or Ironman type races or even USA triathlon races. Yeah. And you still only have 30 seconds to get through it. And 30 seconds to get through 12 meters when you're really only going, you know, a little bit difference in the speed means you have to accelerate. So all the things we've been working on endurance lab where I've been harping on the triathletes to, to do things that are not steady state and to work these VO2s actually mattered because I had to go through a group of guys. Um, it's just the way we were all spaced out that it was just one after another. Right. And I ended up pushing, I think I maxed out at like 750 Watts to get through it. Um, and I held, I, I think it was, I was holding like 305 Watts for about a minute just to get through all three guys without getting a drafting penalty. That's wow. Wow. Yes, yeah, so that was it, that was interesting, but it was definitely fun. It was um, I think all those endurance lab workouts paid off because I saw some guys blowing up later on who who would put in a lot of surges, and you could just tell that that surging just crushed them because they couldn't uh, clear the lactic acid at 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 pace. What's the normal box uh, length that um, that you ha that you have to give, or they or when you have to go around? Because you said twelve meters is here is a little bit bigger than normal. Yeah, I think it's five or seven meters in WTC. Oh, that's way closer. To be able to pass <laughs> yeah yeah you get a bit of a slingshot when you're using the when you're doing the wtc and usat rules yeah there's an itu yeah. it's all you i mean you get a slingshot but you got to work to get into the draft first and then you got to get around them because there's no time yeah whereas in a wtc i can just i can you know I, i'm i'm holding a little bit of draft as i pull as i get to the draft zone so the draft box so it's you know it's it's not as much work yeah absolutely all right well, I am going to throw this to the rest of the coaches here. Um, we're going to share a couple experiences. I've got a couple topics that I'm going to bring up. Um, and we are going to just do a little quick roundtable of just uh, of our experience and um, kind of our tips with um, just racing or preparing for um, a big race or a big ride um, kind of uh, as we go. So um, we'll jump in. Um, some of the things that we like to consider or um, that could be of your consideration is um, the week of the race. Uh, of, of like the things of the week of the race and um, kind of right before the race. Um, I'm going to pass this on to uh, Taya to help uh, kind of move this conversation along if uh, she can help us go through this and uh, we'll all chat and kind of put our two cents in here. Yeah, that sounds good. So uh, racing for me, I had my A event on um, last Sunday. And so the for me, you know, some of the things to think about, you know, everybody's different. So of course you have a plan right to be prepared for your race and you're working super hard you peak and then you taper the week before your event and i had um you know some good intensity still the week of the event so even though the event was on a sunday i had some vo2 work it was a road race on sunday um 25 miles long and so i had some vo2 workouts still lower volume of course um, and doing that tapering, but being striking that balance that keeps your legs sharp um, at the same time they are fresh. And this is something that isn't the same for everyone. And even though you might have a plan, you still have to sort of see how you feel along that week. So there's the, that part of the preparation, which is the training part of it. Then there's the mental preparation and your state of mind, which I think is a good uh, thing for us to share here. Um, everybody's different again. And for me, that week is a week of that I'm very introspective. I'm, I want to be alone. I train on the trainer all week. The weather was amazing, but I didn't get out of the house. I was on the trainer doing my workouts before um, the week before the event. I didn't want to have to deal with the road and deal with cars and worry about where I was going to do my intervals. I typically love doing my intervals outside when the weather is good, but not the week before the event. I just have to have the quiet time 
to focus on things. And one thing that I do quite a bit is visualization. I, of course, study the course ahead of time and I play the race in my head and I visualize how I want the race to unfold for me. Will it always happen that way? Of course not, because things happen and, and I'll tell you what happened in my race, um, but perhaps, you know, perhaps later on and things that go wrong and what do you do about it? Um, you know, we can, we can talk about you know, how do we get over what goes wrong and continue going on? Um, but in any case, that's, that's my thing. It's the visualization part is I visualized for that particular race when I was going to do a, an attack. I visualized when would be a good time to do a breakaway. And it actually turned out to be that way. Um, it worked. And so, and, but then I can't talk about the race either. I, I don't want to talk about the race with anyone. I, <laughs> I just, it, to me, it's just that week of complete isolation. If you could put me in a box, I would just stay in that box. Um, and I get quite nervous, you know, the day before, um, one or two days before, to the point that I am irritable, I'm not fun to be around. It's just, it's just how, how I handle it. And then once I'm lined up. Yeah, I'm sorry to tell you, it sounds like you're like super, super fun person that we. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, I'm sure the husband's like, let's sign up for more races. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's terrible. But I guess on, on the point of um, this taper week um, being in uh, indoors, I think as coaches, um, I, I feel that it, it is a tool that um, I wish that we could um, have our athletes use, utilize a little bit more. Um, a lot of times it's tough to gauge or tough to taper somebody when they are outdoors. They can easily go over efforts. They can easily get out of zones. So having that last week to kind of bring it indoors to have a very controlled situation to get someone tapered and re recovered um, when they've had a really tough you know, prior weeks um, is definitely an asset for, for us as coaches to, give, to be able to give you something very prescribed and so those indoor riders that can come inside for that last couple of days, that last half a week or whatever, it can really help you kind of make sure that you have the fitness you need for your race. Yeah, no, and it, it definitely is. And I, I know when I'm working with folks for tries or, or even running races, they, they get so angry because yeah. they just want to do, they want to go, they want to go. And I'm like, yeah, sorry, your long run until the race right now this week is like five miles. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the things you know we always talk about as coaches. We're 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 telling we're um telling riders to do less, to do less, to do less. <laughs> when when uh, you know to kind of bring them back. So so that so that brings us to um to the couple of days before Taya um for us for me um you know kind of sharing my experiences. I haven't done um uh, any big races like in this situation. I've done a couple fondes. So it's not as intense, um, but the numbers are still big, and the big riders of all the groups are typically there. Um, and even on the big weekend rides, um, you know, a lot of the big names show up. So not as much nerves, um, but definitely visualization. Um, I like the idea of um, really playing things out in your head. A lot of times when I ask athletes, oh, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm just going to sit in the pack. I'm going to try to survive. I think that's not the thing to do. I think really putting yourself like where you want to be, visualizing where you want to be on certain parts. If it's a course that, let's say, you know, it's like Tuesday Night Worlds, it's the Saturday Showdown, um, you know this course, people have ridden it, you know, several, several times, be like, I'm going to try to be here before the, before the climb, I want to do this, I want to execute here. These are check boxes that you need to put up, so that way, as you go through the race, in your head mentally, be like, okay, I did what I was trying to do, okay, I put an effort there, that's what I wanted to do, I'm going to recover here, where you're just not kind of to the whim of what's happening out there and to whatever the groups like you're getting what you want out of this race or this ride or that sort of thing. And I find that the visualization is so powerful and it actually becomes true. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of, yeah, you can visualize yourself. I'm not talking about winning per se. You can visualize yourself winning and you might not win. That's not the point. The point is you decide before the race, how are you going to race? Are you going to be aggressive? Are you going to go all in? Or are you being more cautious and you're just going to take this race as it goes and you're going to stay in the back? Because I had both happen. I had the race that I knew I was going to go in and just be safe and try not to crash. And that was the race oh, yeah. after my first crash. I remember that. I remember that. 
And then so as far as um, as far as attitude coming into the race, then that allows you to kind of have things in your head where you're looking for you're looking for cues that are happening, you're looking for landmarks of where things are, um, and uh, and that sort of thing. So that that puts that in your head. Um, good. Yeah. Well, no, I was gonna I was going to um, I guess perhaps jump into uh, unless anyone has any other comments yeah. on the uh, lessons learned in terms of things that yeah. go wrong and uh, and what do you do about them? Um, Absolutely. I'll give my example then on my eight race. I, um, it was mostly flat, but it had one steep hill that was probably a minute or two long, very steep at uh, 13% or 15% grade. Um, and so, for, and, and it came right after a corner. So we came downhill, had to slow down for a corner and then go immediately into that uphill. On my second lap, um, I had a mechanical. Oh. I had a problem with my chain and my shifting, and I had to get off the bike because at that point I couldn't even fix it on the go given the incline of the climb. So I had to get off the bike. I was with the, the front group, and um, I had to run up the hill. Oh. Um, with the my whole thing? Bike. The whole thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. I couldn't get back on the bike and fix what I had to fix unless it was a flat section of the course. And so I got off the bike and I just ran up and support car came over the SRAM car. Are you okay? I'm like, yes and no, <laughs> but I kept going up. Um, so I lost about, I looked at my power on my file. It was about 45 seconds. And, and with that, I also lost the front group. And so at that point I got up, and back on the bike and I'm on my own. I am between the lead group and the back group and just on my own. Um, and I kept telling myself, you know what? It's not over until it's over. It's not over until it's over. You just, just never know what's gonna happen to that front back. Just keep going as hard as you can. And that's what I did. Um, it all worked out. I had the chance to um, hook up with another group we worked together until the last mm, about five, 10 minutes of the race where I, I did an attack and I was able to break away. And, and I ended up with a great result in that race. So it just, again, you know, I could have felt defeated having lost the front group, having to get off the bike and run up, but you know what? You're there, you trained for it. You do the best that you can. And it happened again, this week, um, on Thursday, that was not my A event. It was just, you know, I decided to do one other race, and it was a crit, um, where the turns, and I'm not experienced with crits. This was my third crit ever. The turns were so tight, and I got dropped from the group. And again, I'm thinking, well, you know what? It's not over until it's over. And sure enough, I was able to catch up with the front group and finish with the pack. So yeah. it's really having that mindset of, you never know what's going to happen. Somebody might come behind you and tow you and you're able to work together or this front group, something might happen. They slow down and you catch them. So just keep going. No, yeah. that's, a, that's a great point. And if anyone's been watching the tour this last week, I mean, you saw exactly. Adam Yates bite it when he should have, when he had the race in hand and that gave the race to Julian Alaphilippe, the stage to Julian Alaphilippe. And I mean, there's no way he, he sh there's no way he should have won that race at that stage, but you know, things happen and that happens not just in the big stages. It happens to all of us guys blow up, ladies crash. Um, the impetus of the group just goes away because you know, everyone's looking at each other. You never know. Yeah. So these, these, these things can happen on all, on all levels of racing, on all levels of riding. Um, so really be being able to pull from yourself and to be kind of dig deep is is super important um and just to stay steady and um you know knowing that you put the training in to be able to put efforts out and stay steady and you know be able to look down and be like okay this is the number where i should be at if something happens if something goes my way um i'll, I'll be here um i'm, I'm available i'm it, it, it can happen to me because i'm still i'm still pushing myself forward um so super important um i guess a couple other uh, lessons shared um i know um i've got i've got stories of woes and of a uh, of a uh, you know rides where you know GPS um, on your Garmin your plans have gone awry because you've planned this you plan that you've got all your tech all ready to go and um, 
all of a sudden your Garmin doesn't know where you are and all your numbers are off and, and that sort of thing. And, or um, plenty of stories from athletes on the day of the races where um, uh, power meters don't pair up because everybody's around and there's 100 power meters around you and you're trying to pair and you're trying to calibrate on that day and it just doesn't happen. Um, so those are things that, you know, that can happen and uh, will happen on the, on the worst times or uh, garments come up um, and you show up to, uh, you know, the race and, it, and it's dead for whatever reason. Um, so these are things that uh, you, you can't um, plan for, but just understand that these are things that can happen. Um, and, um, you know, we try to get a feel for, to make sure that you've got some feel for how things are, if, if, if uh, these are, so that you can put those powers out and kind of ride by feel, you know. Right. And then on the other hand, though, you know, depending on what might happen during the race, you might decide that you are going to pull out of the race. And that's the best decision for you at that point, given, let's say, safety. Right. And I think um, Andrea has a good example here okay. where, you know, the, the weather just was it, it, for her. It just wasn't safe to keep going with the race that she was in. Andrea, do you want to share? Uh, is is yeah, it too early? So, too early, Andrea? Are you? Are no. you? Have you recovered from it all? <laughs> I have. You, you have to suck these things up. So, yeah. as you, I don't know if you're aware, we had like a stint of incredible weather here in Ireland, with even drought status and hot sunshine. So, I was confident I was going to have a race that I wasn't worrying about with getting really, really cold in the swim, and we had a, a magical swim. Now the wind started picking up that on on our drive to the venue. And we racked on the, the same morning. And I was a little bit anxious about that because I hadn't been able to get a smaller wheel on the front of my bike. It arrived on mm. Monday, typically. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a, a lovely swim. I came out in the top 11, got on the bike. It was about 17 degrees, which is comfortable. And then the heavens just opened with wind <laughs> and rain. And I was like, what is happening? And the trees were sideways and we were in the west of Ireland where it's beautiful and scenic and you have wild ponies and lakes and everything was just blowing sideways. And it was coming from the left. So at least you had a constant wind and rain with the gusts. You kind of like the bike. I was quite knuckled at that point, just trying to hang on and very focused. Also realized it was very hard to drink and eat because I just couldn't let go. Um, so that that was food for thought with how I'd manage in, in those sort of conditions. But we had a climb at the 45K mark. And as I was coming down, I, I had awareness about how cold I was. Everything was just starting to go numb. I couldn't feel my arms. And I thought to myself, do I keep going? And in the direction back, I was going to have the wind. It was a very busy road. So if the wind was the direction of the wind, the bigger trucks and buses were going to block it. And then I was going to get a blast which I wasn't able to manage that well with the 55s on the front so I thought okay I, I have that to deal with and I'm so so cold and I just made a call and it was and then I doubted myself and then I went on a bit and then a bus whipped past me and I nearly came off my bike and I thought no I'm done I have a race mm. in five weeks time it's just not worth getting sick or, or, or having something happen. So I told the marshals and I went off and sat in a hotel they totally forgot about me I actually went AWOL. <laughs> so like they forgot that I had reported coming out of the race. There was mayhem anyway later on, which was quite funny, but I had done what I was meant to do. But I looked at my Garmin and the temperature had dropped to 55. So I was never going to get warm. And I just had to be at peace with myself that I was close to hypothermic. I was shaking for 90 minutes that it was the right call, but your mind goes mad because it's like well you should have gone on you should have pushed through but i actually don't think i could have got myself warm um so yeah that was my suck it up moment <laughs> yeah it's it's yeah. definitely a it's a tough call to make um you know yeah. you, you prepared for you're saying ian no, i was gonna say there's <clears throat> there's hot weather riders and there's cold weather riders mm. um sometimes cold weather riders can do hot weather because you can prep for it but i will tell you if you are not a cold weather rider you don't do cold weather. You just don't. And and you made I think Andrew made the right call because it gets to a certain point when you're when your body starts shutting down to a point where not just physically, because physically a lot of times you can push through it, but mentally you become foggy. Mentally you become not attentive. Mentally you come to the point where you're you're a danger to yourself and others on the road. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I was so cold, I couldn't hold the cup of tea for over an hour, that it was like a little tsunami going on in there. Um, so when I realized, because I hadn't been aware how cold I was, because I was battling the wind, it was, it was funny. And I, like I'd said, oh God, I, if I had put my arm warmers on, would I have been okay? But I think it was just so wet that my boyfriend just said, there, you, there was just no way you were going to get yourself out of that hole. So just is what yeah. it is. Lessons. That's right. But the next one will be warm and I will be prepared, <laughs> even for Arctic conditions. <laughs> and the other thing is when you're choosing events that play to your strengths, right? So a lot of um, writers are, you know, they might try new things or they might do things that are happening around them uh, in their area because they cannot travel. So they're sort of stuck with certain events that are in their area. But I think that it'll, over time, you try different events and you see the ones that play to your strengths, but also the ones that you know mentally you can give your all. And a good example is, you know, for me, crit racing. Um, yeah, could I do crit racing? And, and uh, you know, I, I have explosive power. So that sort of event is fine for me in terms of power. But on the other hand, I really don't like doing the circuit thing with a bunch of riders really close to me. This is something that I don't know if I will ever get over it. And if I don't, you know what, it's just not something that I want to do. So, um, but then, but then for many of our lab riders, you know, we're trying different things this year as well such as crit racing, um, cyclocross. Some, some of them are planning on trying cyclocross in the fall. Again, you know, do things, experiment with them, give them a couple of times. But if it's not something that you enjoy, since you're not a professional bike racer, don't beat yourself up, you know, and do the things that you enjoy. And it, perhaps it's not even racing. We do have other lab members who um, don't like to race. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. You know, you do things that challenge yourself. They like to be against the clock. They like to get the challenge from the terrain they're in and not necessarily in a race that has a podium at the end. So there are other things that motivate them. Right. And I think finding that why, again, you know, last week we talked a little bit about that and finding kind of what, what draws you to riding, what draws you to training and what motivates you to get on the bike in the morning every day or you know the time that kind of you know put put yourself on the line and if you can find that that's a that's where you can find you know your happiness essentially and so um finding events that make you happy or that not even not always even to your strengths but will will kind of make you happy to do that route happy to be with the group doing that sort of thing i think is important um so well, and I think the big thing to understand is we are, as people, only of and not as much value as others view us by our race results. <laughs> this is so true. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not crushing everything you do and you're not getting into the hardest, the worst condition races, then you're pretty much of no use as a person and yeah. should just go away. No. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You should. Yeah. You should. You should. <laughs> but, if you, but if you don't do that, you could just be the best you can, Ian, okay? Yeah. <laughs> No, but it, it does. I mean, yeah, that's the only thing I always laugh at people and like, well, I have to do this. Like, do, but do you have to do this? Yeah. Do you? yeah. I mean, you don't. We pay for these things because we're supposed to enjoy it and have a good time. Now, look, yeah, not everything is, is rainbow unicorns and, and, you know, great tasty muffins. But um, if at the end of the day you're looking at it and going, uh, no way, I'm going to hate everything about this day, then don't do it. I, I've, done that. I've done that in two races and it's never going to happen again. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. All we right, a, Ted, oh, go ahead. We did an event last year, the Texas Independence Relay, and I have to say it was the most fun I've ever had. Um, if yeah. anyone's doing it next year, so it's just a team of running 200K, and everyone was graffitiing one another's cars and vans, and it was, it was so much fun. You just kept, kept running until you got from, was it Gonzalez to Houston? Um, so it was so, overnight. So 
Wait, sounds that sounds like, like rolling criminal activity. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a <laughs> sounded like a California riot. <laughs> you just run, you do graffiti, you run, you do graffiti, and then like <laughs> Oh, so time. much so much fun. The Keys 100 is like that. You uh it's, you know, right, roughly 2 mile legs more or less and it's in mid-May and running from uh Key Largo down to Key West. It's it, it's 100 miles. It's it's a pretty brutal day at the, if you have to run in the afternoon. But uh it's a lot of fun. Yeah, those 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 uh, relay type rides are definitely getting more and more popular. Um, we got the uh, was it the Ranger Rangers series, um, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a big party. It's it's a it's a good time. It's still competitive, um, but man, running through the night um, and just like waking up for shifts and trying to recover that's like a whole nother game, right? Like trying to get rest in between legs. Uh, between you run with groups, fast yeah. people, and then you're done in like eleven or twelve hours. There you go. There you go. Uh, we took twenty eight, and we didn't do too badly. Uh, yeah, see, it got it got quite competitive between us as well as against everybody else. Uh, wow. but you're ti- you're tired after it, um, and you stink. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. Uh, but yeah, it was it was great, great fun, and you felt like it was just it was fun and it was competitive. But you weren't you were with the team, and I think team events like that are good. And we're all individual sports now compared to maybe growing up when we did do team stuff. So I think it's good to just go out and have fun again sometimes. Yeah, then I mean, you have to depend on other people's performances. I don't know. I'm very single child. <laughs> well, I made sure Garen was on my team, so we were there okay. You. <laughs> there you go. All right, Tia, do we want to talk a little bit about um, recovery, kind of after big events like this? Yeah. So um, the the thing is, you look at certain events, and of course, you know the uh, the obvious is that if you have a long event, you need more recovery. And it might be less obvious to some that even though your event was short, you still might need a lot of recovery because it's not just the race itself. There is the week before the race. So there's a lot of fatigue that goes into racing that is not only related to the actual physical effort that you put in on the day of racing. There's, um, it's almost like you probably felt like this in other parts of your life where when you finally settle down, when you finally relax, you just, it's just, there's, you just feel how tired you really are. Yeah. And so this is where you have to take into account, you know, not just looking at your files and thinking, oh, I just need two days of recovery because my race was only 30 minutes long or an hour long. You might need more. You might need more for all the mental fatigue that you went through and um, that translate into some physical fatigue as well. So, but rule of thumb, right? So if I, did my race of one hour on Sunday, I took, and my next race was on a Thursday. I actually had easy days throughout. I had um, three easy days to recover from my one hour race on Sunday. And um, if you do a longer event, um, then you might need some more. So what do you do? You don't, don't need to be off the bike. You can do an easy spin. You can do some skill work. Um, but really get that recovery in. Yeah. Um, I guess question out to Andrea for you know the 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 tough day the tough day in Ireland. Um, what kind of time were you did you take off after that? Uh, I didn't. Yeah. In fact, I nearly <laughs> wanted to do. Uh, uh, I turned into Ian mode. I think. Yeah. I actually I I wanted to run a half marathon the following day because <laughs> I felt I hadn't done it, <laughs> but it rained. So we actually yeah. did. I I I just kept going. I with training because yeah. um, yeah. I could um, because yeah, it had it had had, we, we had played our recovery really well for that one so that I'd be straight into a block for my next race which is the main one which is partly yeah. why I did well, and there you go I think there's also a difference between your B and C races and your A race mm. um, because I think there you know for me the, the recovery from the A race was harder um, but then you look at my numbers for the A race, they were the biggest numbers I've ever produced yet. That's yeah, awesome. it's, it's, it's definitely weird though. If you look at things, so I had, I did Ironman Louisville in 2010 and I blew up in the heat. It's pretty spectacular actually. Um, it was pretty awesome. And <laughs> I walked from, I walked from mile eight to mile, tw- uh, mile 20 and then oh. jogged it in from there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Oh my God. Um, yeah, long, long day. Um, but surprisingly, the next day, I was 
like fine. Mostly because I had just done a 12 mile recovery walk, at, you know, in the middle of the marathon. But um, but I, I pulled the plug at that point, and I just wasn't going very hard. But then I've had like a half Ironman, you know, half the distance that I drilled it from the gun, and I needed two weeks. I mean, it just completely destroyed afterwards. And it was two yeah. weeks before I could do any kind of real training. Now, some of that was mental, some of that was physical. Um, I took a week off after this, this last race where I did nothing um, from the race until we got back here. And even then, the first couple of days, I just eased back into it. So now I'm kind of back into the training a little bit. But um, yeah, it, I, I also did a lot of recovery with Danish beer, um, Danish pastries. Nice. And uh, every other good thing that like Danish ice cream was really good too. I uh, did see that. I yeah. did see that. So are we getting? Yep. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was gonna say so. Some of it, it's it's that physical side of it that's clearly there because your body does need to recover. And from cycling, I found my my physical recovery is a lot less than when I'm doing longer runs because you just beat your body up um, in the longer runs. But and it, and the TT type position too in the bike for a longer period it takes me more to recover. Um, than just a road race, but um, but it's more that mental side of it. It's that mental side to get your brain to recover. And I had one of my athletes; she wanted to get right back into training. I said, "Look, it's okay to take a week off. You need to take a week off. Your brain needs to get back into enjoyment mode rather than training and racing mode." Yeah, the the, the brain part. In fact, you might need twenty four hours just to unwind from that one race to begin to relax. I. You know, I couldn't sleep. The the I had my race at 8 a.m. and I couldn't sleep that night. I was still wired up. So yeah, I would resonate with that. I'd be hyper hypersensitive. There's a whole bubble of energy around these races that starts in the build, and then you have it in the after, and then there's a whole energy with some races. People looking up times and events, and it's like your head is frying. So. I'll actually take a time out when I get home and unpacked, like in the afternoon, and I'll lie down and I'll just work on relaxing every single part of my body and trying to get the brain turned off. Otherwise, it just, you, I found I didn't sleep either. Um, and it just brings the body into that re recovery mode. Might be worth trying. And for anybody else that finds that they're just totally wired, wired, you literally have to cut the cord with that race <laughs> to, yeah. to step back into life. Some, some really good tips there just to get into that recovery mode. Uh, we run a lot, um, being in an area that has so many races and so many rides, um, with the athletes that I work with here, I mean, you may have like a Tuesday crit practice and a Saturday race and a Sunday race and then like a Thursday throwdown. So it's like, every, it's like a four day stage race separated by a day or two and these guys are just riding just like on a fine wire and it's just trying to get them to not burn out is is the chick because there's just so much intensity and so much a uh, uh, competition all the time and and getting people to understand that there's you know there's levels there's b there's c races there's things you're going to train through there's things that you're going to be tired at and it, it's it's really it's really tough for people and when they get it right they have a really great season and when they not when they don't then they get burned out very quickly and it's it's a really tough mental thing for people to work through and and being here in where in California, where there's just so much to do and so many opportunity, you just see it so often where people just burn out so quick in the season. All right, what do we've got last year today? We've talked about um, post. We had a little bit of conversation on um, in the form about um, post ride uh, post ride recovery and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me post-ride uh, fueling and that sort of thing. Um, and I know um, Andre had started that conversation and uh, a couple of people had chimed in. Um, what, did, what did we have from that? <laughs> so it's uh, for everybody, it might be hard. And it were, so Andrea put that question out in the forum. Can you eat right after an event? Because you, mm -hmm. you to kickstart your recovery. And we're finding that many people are not able to eat right after. Um, yeah. And so the option might be you have a recovery shake with your protein and your carbs um, until you're able to eat again. But maybe I'll, I'll give that to Andrea so she can provide her comments on this. Yeah, I was thinking about it. Um, I was trying to make it concise into some rules. 
So the first one would be to be aware and mindful that recovery starts with your race preparation and it continues in your race fueling. So it's better to eat what we may feel is too much in the week before and to do, you know, to, to feel well on the bike, because that is, is, it's not only preparing us and recovering us from all of the weeks in the lead up to our A race, but it's limiting the damage that's actually happening during that race. And, and that's what you want to do. So if you're going into that race well fueled with a little bit of protein, um, you're going to limit the damage that's actually happening. So for, for some events, you might even want to consider, and I don't suggest trying doing this without trying, a little bit of protein in, 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 in the mix, or the peptide carbohydrate drinks, um, or even some people in Ironman will take away protein drink in transition. But oh. you, don't, you don't have to get protein in. It's helpful, but it may not suit you, and it may be too hard in your system. But it is a very good idea to eat well so that you're not totally creating so much damage. So then the kind of second rule is, well, how urgent is it to recovery, to recover? You may have plenty of time. It could be the last race of your season, or you might not have another race for a couple of weeks, or it could be urgent um, because you have to get back into training and you have an event coming up very quickly again. So if it's urgent, you, you have to get something in and preferably liquid protein and carbohydrates Im immediately. Um, and then your hydration and your electrolytes, and then to move forward onto carbohydrate and protein with some vegetable meals. You want to aim to include some antioxidant and anti-inflammatory foods, not natural ones, not supplements. Um, if time doesn't really matter, then I would listen to how's my stomach feeling? What do I sort of want? Bear in the back of your mind that the protein is going to be the most important one. And the carbs aren't so crucial unless it's really important that you have to recover quickly. Most of us have eaten our way through preparation and racing. So yep. if weight is a concern, you, you might not need that many carbohydrates at all. <laughs> um, and then, you know, if it's your last race of the season, ugh, mentally, I think, knock yourself out and just, just go out and have whatever you want. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. It's so yeah. important. Um, if you were to look at what nutrients are important, um, protein, that's your repair stuff, your hydration, uh, your antioxidants. So you want plants and you want color. If you can get them into the meal, they're going to help. Um, you want to try and include some anti-inflammatory nutrients from things like ginger or turmeric. Um, and then some like good carbs that give you your minerals and things. So you, if, if you're in the middle of your season and you've more ahead, you want to make it good quality. But you can also make it good quality and enjoyable. So it's, it's just playing around with that finding what works for you. It doesn't have to be the same thing every time. I think we can be creatures of habit, but sometimes a little break away from the norm can be good too. So if you want pizza, have pizza, but have it with, be mindful that it mightn't have enough protein. So maybe get like a chicken salad on the side or something that brings whoa, up whoa, that protein. Whoa, 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 time out. Time out. <laughs> it sounds like you, you're demonizing you, pizza. You, you're, gonna, you're gonna wake up eating that. You, you almost, yeah. Pizza, it's got plenty of protein, so stop bagging <laughs> <laughs> you can still make a fun choice better maybe we're boring yeah. in our house but if we're gonna have something that we like we'll try and add some it, it depends like i said yeah. that last meal like what you've done you you're meant to do that you're meant to enjoy that 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 big race and and what happens after but if you had say your a race and a month out and with another iron man or something then i suppose you're getting back on to keeping it yeah. good a little bit quicker so just some some conscious some conscious thought about kind of what your, what your plan is. Um, I did a little quick video about kind of thoughts and just putting yourself, you know, putting yourself up to having a plan afterwards versus just going with your, going with your gut. Um, just saying, oh, I'm gonna enjoy this by doing this. I'm gonna have an opportunity after this to enjoy, you know, um, what was it? Um, ice cream wrapped in waffle with, um, you know, all kinds of toppings like uh, Ian loves to do. Um, that sort of thing, and you just know that you have that. You're you're working towards that reward. Um, I think is important, and just knowing that that how you're going to get your recovery and how you're going to reward yourself, whether it be mentally or or um, nutritionally, and just understanding that that's how you want to get to. A lot of times, people want to break it down to I'm going to do X Y Z every single time, like Andrea was saying. But a lot of times, it just you just need to have a general plan so you can keep yourself healthy and get yourself recovered for what you want to do next. Yeah, and I think. I'm sorry, all I heard from that entire conversation was we need to come up with a post-workout recovery beer that has protein in it. There you go. A 
Just put protein powder in your beer, Ian. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. And shake it, shake it, shake Out it. Out with some protein powder. That's what we need. You could probably put, you know what, you could probably put non-flavored amino acids in your beer and you would never know. That's right. <laughs> I want that on video. I want to watch that on video. Yeah. There you go. A nice IPA. You got to get the carb ratio right, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So with this round table, I think we've come, we've come full circle. Was there anything that we wanted to add as far as racing to remind our riders or kind of share experiences um, about today? We talked a little bit about um, the week and the day before races. We talked a little bit about kind of what you want to learn from those races and kind of getting a report and kind of looking back. Um, also, how to deal with and um, things that go wrong, um, choosing the right event to whether it be your strengths or kind of what makes you happy, a little bit about recovery and um, a new invention of beer with protein so that you can get your recovery. So was there anything else we wanted to add here to this conversation? All right. All right. That's, that does it. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, really quick, um, we are running up on time, so we want to respect everyone's time here. We want to talk a little bit about this week in the lab. And um, if you're thinking, oh, my gosh, did I forget to do a workout? You actually didn't. You, we are actually on and off week. Um, so that means um, just making sure you're maintaining your strength. Um, and um, Ian, I know I haven't done a whole lot of multi-sport updates. Um, can you tell us what's coming up? We can kind of transition for the horizon. But I know we're just trying to maintain strength, doing your 15 minutes. Um, 15 minute workouts, that is really key. That should be kind of your staple foundation every day. Um, I don't know if you're getting tired of seeing Taya doing all the, the same workout over and over. You can run it backwards or forwards, I don't know, but just keep doing them, just keep getting them going. But um, Ian, what's coming up um, on the, on the, um, in, on yeah, the um, multi Yeah, thanks Jason, I've got, um, yeah, unfortunately my stuff isn't here, so it's very hard for me to, to film yeah. workouts. Um, for sure. But yeah, we are, we are going to be focusing on Olympic distance uh, racing for the uh, upcoming lab for the nice. multi-sport add-on. So there'll be a lot more intensity. The runs will be a little shorter. The swims will be a little shorter. But there's going to be a lot of 100 repeats and 50 repeats, things to work on building that speed um, and doing it on short, uh, on short rest. So uh, for those of you who don't like doing speed workout in the run, you probably aren't going to like this multi-sport add-on as much. But it's definitely going to be uh, something that's really good, and uh, and I promise you, these are the kind of workouts that I that I do all the time to help get my speed down to that that low five minute mile pace. So I don't know if I'm doing, or or run, when I'm running a 10k in, in 34 or 35 minutes, these are the, the speed workouts that I do for that. Um, so it definitely helps out quite a bit. Definitely a different beast from what I understand as the distance gets shorter, um, intensity and those sort of things, they need to be right on par. So super exciting to have that uh, Olympic um, distance focus here and we'll kind of round out um, our wheelhouse of, uh, of different training here. So on the horizon, um, we've got two labs um, in the, starting in about a week and then um, another one after. I'm going to have uh, Taya cover the execution lab and I'll talk a little bit about the Academy Booster coming up here in the next week or so. Yeah, so the execution, execution lab, excuse me, next week, uh, we're going to be working on developing the uh, athlete's fitness by targeting the specific energy systems and skills that will translate into faster and more efficient writing. So reaping all the benefits of your training so far through uh, workouts that will be shorter in terms of volume, but higher in terms of intensity to support the increasing time that our riders are spending outside at rides and events. Um, obviously, athletes training indoors would also benefit from all of these uh, skills that we're going to bring into the to the lab here. Yeah, I think it's just going to expand, and um, again, just you know, bringing things full circle with uh, what we're doing here in the lab, bringing you from base to build to really performance, and um, now to execution to allow you to really reap all the benefits of all the work that you've done. If you've joined us um, this whole journey, or if you're just jumping in and trying to really sharpen that knife for um, end of year events or end of season events, this is definitely something that's gonna be great. Um, another thing that we have coming up is called Academy Booster. Um, if you are riding on the Zwift, Zwift platform, it is something coming up in, um, it looks like two weeks. And if you've done the Zwift Academy before, um, it's a very like hustling, go, everybody talking about it, everybody riding, um, doing all these rides during the academy, and there's a lot of promotion behind it, and a lot of people on board, and 
what we've done is we've taken um, kind of the experiences that we've had from our team at Team ODZ as well as other writers at Endurance Lab and kind of brought um, a well-rounded approach to bring, um, I guess, would be kind of a more of a training plan approach to it because a lot of times Swift Academy is great in fact that it challenges us um, but in fact the intensity can be a little bit skewed and um, the amount of stress may be not enough for some of those riders who may have either been training the rest of the season or they're looking to, for a more well-rounded approach because of the intensity being so high you may need different things and that's what this Academy Booster is. So if you are signing up for the Swift Academy and you're looking to get the most out of your training this is going to be the lab for you. It's going to help develop those skills and fitness, not only um, that you've seen from the endurance plan, but help you really um, meet those demands that you'll see later on. Um, by getting the support um, from the certified coaches here at the endurance lab, you're going to get the dedicated forum that we talk about to ask questions, to share your accomplishments about the lab, um, and essentially those workouts that will help round out the Zwift Academy workouts. So they are in addition to, to help even out kind of what we're doing in the academy. So along with that advice, just along the way, just to help with schedule adjustments and that sort of thing. So check out endurancelab.fit for that. Um, and we're gonna be having that um, available. It's actually available now. Both of them are available now to set up and people are getting signed up now as we speak. So with that, was there anything else from the coaches? I'm really glad to have everyone back. It looks like um, um, Coach Mitch will be back soon. Um, he's still renovating his, uh, his kitchen. So he's still working on that. Um, and of course, work and travel. I think he's headed to a what is it, a beer and wine festival today. It's tough work he's got. So, <laughs> so with that, um, was there anything else from the coaches? All right. Um, hearing nothing there, I want to thank everybody here for joining us today in the Coaches Corner. And if it's your first time listening and would like to hear more about the content from the Endurance Lab, head over to your favorite podcast app and search Endurance Lab or head over to YouTube and search the same and click subscribe. Don't forget, we're also available on Spotify now. If you're a Spotify podcast listener, we're available over there as well. For more information on the labs we talked about today, head over to EnduranceLab.fit to learn where you can join us to train smart, learn more, and get results. Have a good day, everybody.